Hello, good day, welcome back. So we're gonna be looking here at um, the last chapter in section two. And so we're gonna wrap up, since we leave in chapter, chapter two, we're just gonna wrap up with a little example. And so basically, what we're gonna do is try and review some of the things we've learned in this chapter. And so we're gonna look at pointers again, and functions, flow control, and packages, okay? And of course, there's a contrived application just to give us the opportunity to practice some of the things we have learned. All right, so let's jump, close this off, and so this, and go to our code. So here I'm sitting on my prompt, and basically what I did was created a section 12 directory in chapter two, and open up my code editor, and here I am. I haven't written anything yet, but so what is our contrived application that we are actually gonna play with that's gonna allow us to see those things? Well. Let's create a main that go file and we do package main. And so funct main, these are the things that we must do anyway. And so we will say like uh, fmt that print ln and awesome um, demo application or awesome application, right? Um, so uh, my awesome application, for example. Come on, if I can only type, okay. <laughs> okay, so what does this application do? So we should have some idea of what it's gonna do. And again, it's a contrived application. And basically what we wanna do is be able to say that our, our application is gonna read some data from some storage and run some com complex computation on that data and then write it back out to storage, okay? Um, so um, awesome application you know, ah, come on, um, reads data from storage and runs, reads data from storage, runs complex computation and writes data, ah, writes data, write results back to storage, All right? Um, let me put some new lines here, so. Um, back to storage. All right, so it seems like if it's pretty straightforward in terms of what we need to do, right? I mean, if we go here, we can say to do, the first to do is, um, first to do is ready to get data from storage. The second to do is to run complex computation, all right? And then the third to do is to save data, save result to storage, right? Um, not much more difficult than that. Well, if, let's think about it. So what if, if we know about function and instead of writing all in our main application, what we want to do, we can use a function that says, hey, um, get data for me and from wherever um, and return that data, right? And for now, we're gonna keep things simple and just say, oh, we're gonna, the data we get in is a string from storage, <clears throat> excuse me, and our string of data, we're gonna run some computer. You can imagine that the string of data is some text representing a really a book. And so maybe we wanna, you know, look for certain patterns in the book or whatever. So um, something like that. So um, let's say I return, this is my data, for example, right? And so that's pretty easy. Um, I can say data is equals to um, get a sign, you know, get data. And so that's fine. But it's also possible that when we try to get some data, um, um, it might not be, you know, um, available. Maybe they may see some error in trying to get our data. So maybe we should account for that. So we should not only return a string, but maybe, um, you know, a string and an error message, for example. And so um, we could return, as you know, two values from our um, thing. So we should do something like um, error. And then, of course, since we know about um, testing flow control, we can say if um, nil, right, is equals to error, basically, if there's no error, um, but usually what we wanna do is, as soon as we detect an error, we wanna 
return right away okay so if um, error not equals to nil or however you want to do it if nil not equals to error um, so if there's some error um, then what we want to do is log fatal you know ln and we want to do the error log the error all right and so and then if of course there's no error then we can do uh, log that print ln whatever our data is okay so something like that so why is my thing complete oh okay so this is doing this because uh, there we go I need to return two things so if this is an error then I can say error system use the error system imports to create a new error and then say some data error for example um, or actually in this case I don't actually have an error so I'm gonna do nil okay so I actually return in some data this is my data and so there's no error and so if I go here and go go run main um, I should see awesome application this is my data okay great um, maybe what I want to do is come down here and say um, log printf um, awesome finish successfully successfully okay all right good so if we have an error then it should have thing now if I want to demonstrate uh, dun, dun, dun. why is this complete data declare but not used okay fine whatever um, for now we'll do data all right okay so this should work um, fine and then if I do want to show the error path so let me just run it again show this works fine and if I want to show the error path, I can just do e r r errors errors that near, and then some error. Okay, and then now if my application should save, and how do I know I can do error that new? Well, if I go to the errors package here, um, see that oh, there's this new um, method, and I can create a new error. Okay, so create your own new error. So there we go, and then I'm going to rerun this, and so some error and I don't see, um, you know, it's fatal, I don't see this message. So good, so that's working fine so far. So let's put nil there to return error. Now the other thing we say we're gonna do is we're gonna get some data and um, let's see, let's do something more complicated than just returning this. What about if every time we run our program, there's a chance that it might actually fail, right? And so, <clears throat> and so for that, we might actually want to do something a little bit more complicated. Of course, we, we know from when we cover um, full control and so on, we had the possibility of, we, we did random data, right? And so why don't we do something like that? Why don't we say that um, we have rand.seed and we can see the random number generator with time that now, we did this already, convert that to unix time so basically we can call time that now get the current time whatever that is convert it to unix which is going to give us a number 64-bit number we're going to use that to see the random number generator and then every time we see the random number generator we can do i colon equals to rand that int int n and we're going to limit that to between zero and three if you remember this is zero to you know the number whatever number you pass in minus one Okay, so basically we have three possible numbers that we can get. And so one of the things we can do is say switch, right, on i. And depending on what i is, if the case is zero, we can say, um, you know what, let's create a variable var d, which is a string. And it's going to be an empty string. And we're going to say, um, you know, d is equals to, you know, this is a lot of data. For example and in case one we can say d is equal to this is even more data than before okay and default um, in that case um, well we have the case where d is already initialized to be an empty string so we'll just not do anything to d and we'll return um, d and in this case what's our return value well here we can say return you know d and errors that 
new, there is no data. All right, so that's our error message. So does that kind of make sense? Um, again, this is very contrived example. So why is this a rand, a rant? Okay, so very contrived. So all I'm doing is initializing my random number generator and we're gonna get a number and basically um, depending on whatever my random number generator gave me, I decided to either return one of these values or no error. So if I go and I run this now, um, awesome. Uh, okay, and then there's no data. Okay, it's not always gonna happen in order like that. Um, you know, it's random, so who knows. Um, but at least you could see sometime I run it, I get no data. Well, not yet, but the, the first time, th the third time I run it, oh, there we go, okay? So this is kind of um, fine. Um, so, okay, so if we have data, then now what we might wanna do is actually um, try to store it um, somewhere, right? Uh, well, no, we say what we wanna do is not store it just yet, but actually run some computation. So we say font um, run computation, for example, right? And maybe, um, and so this takes on a string, um, which is our input and it return, let's say an int, right? So it runs some computation over this string that we get out of this data and then it thinks. So this is our data D and there's the result um, int. So of course, if you give it data, it should come back with some kind of result. We're gonna assume that though, once you give it data, it always produces some result. There's no error, for example, because if there was error in the data, we wouldn't call it, to, for example. And so what should we really do in this function? Well, I'm just gonna return um, the length of the string. Um, very easy. Um, this is a built-in function called length in Go, and it returns um, the length of some collection type data or expression. So for a string, which is a collection of characters or runes, uh, it returns how many they are. So that's our very complicated um, functions there. Um, there. So um, we're gonna run the computation. So we get result is equals to run computation. Uh, come on, run computation on data, all right? And now we're using data, so I'm gonna put result here. And so now I'm going to run this again. And so get 21, okay, no data, 21, 34, okay? So looks like our um, thing is running, working a little bit fine. Um, the next thing we want to do is we said, well, um, we want to store, um, you know, find some place to store or um, uh, or or result, right? So in that case, um, we should call some function to give us a um, place to store results. So we should probably call something like, you know. Uh, store data or something like that, right? Um, some function to store data. So font store data or store result, right? And it takes an int. And if it can't store it for some reason, it should return an error message. Because who knows if it can, just like when we call to get data, it could possibly fail. So same thing with when we um, go for store um, our data, it's possible that oh, it may not store successfully. So in this case, our store result function might actually have to call another function to actually get like a place where it can store the data, where, you know, or data store, right? Get a storage engine. So get, you know, storage engine, for example. And when it gets a storage engine, if it's, you know, if nil, right, not equals to error, then it should return that error, all right? If you can't get it, if you can't initialize the storage engine, then return the error. Otherwise to that, then somehow it should store the data in the database engine. For us, our database is just a pointer to an integer, so we can just do that and store the result, which we're gonna call R, okay? So basically, when we say a call get storage engine, it's returning us a pointer to where we should store the result, or if there's an error, it returns nil and the error, why we can't store it. And then of course, um, you know, uh, 
if we can store it, we just dereference that pointer and store a result there. And then if we can store a result, we return nil, which means that though everything was all good. We were able to store our result. Well, what about this get storage engine? So function get storage engine. Um, we know it, it doesn't take any parameter, but it returns um, two things. It returns um, a pointer to int where you can store your thing or an error, right? That's what we know. So how might this look? Well, uh, let's do it this way. Let's just do, um, again, we're gonna do rand. Well, if we pulled our random C generator out of here, so let's cut it and we put it up here in font in in it. Remember that each package um, you can if well let me just say that the one thing about a package is that it can have this init function um, even if it's the main package. And what the mean is this init function is special. It says for any package that have an init function, this function gets runs first before um, the main of your um, application. Now if you're just talking about a package alone, let's say you had an application and you included some other packages that had this init function, well those init and those other packages are going to get run first before your main get run. So that's something very nice because if you're using a package and it needs to do some initialization, the init in that package is going to get to run um, before main gets to run. So we can do that there and then now we can in here we can where's our storage engine we can say um you know i colon equals to ran that int 2 which will give us a value of 0 um, int n 2 which will give us a value of 0 1 and we can say you know if i equals to 0 then what do we want to do um let's return um in that case we can return a pointer to an int, right? So we return the address of D and nil for error. So what is D? D is, like I just said, var D equals to zero. Or, you know, you can initialize it however you want. We have one more ways to initialize thing. Else, um, you know, since we, we're not, if we, I is not equal to zero, if I is equal to zero return, if I is not equal to zero, then we're here. So we don't have to do else. We can just return um, nil because we return an integer pointer, and we can say errors that nil failure, you know, to initialize storage engine, right? Or get storage engine something to get storage engine. So we're going to return that error message. And so now, let's see, get get storage engine returns pointer to int so why am I getting an error here um, get undefined uh, 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 uh. did I spell that correctly get storage uh, let's just copy this get storag engine let me paste that there huh yes it looks like it's the same thing um, take my time try and figure out my oh error went to went away. Maybe I mistyped something before. Okay, so this is looking um, good. So let's try and run it and see what we get. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, um, so I run computation. Oh, I didn't even try to store it. So now I should try and store it. So I can say error equals to store result. And I try to store that result. right and of course if oh and actually i don't even need to do a thing here i can say um i can do this if error and then this is the, the, that initialization function i mentioned that you can do for if statements switch statements and a for loop um the simple initialization function so i can do that if nil not equals to error then you know log that fatal ln whatever the error is okay so basically what i'm saying is this i'm saying before you do the test 
do this simple initialization of ERR, all right, of my error variable by calling this function, and this function is going to return whether or not it was able to st store the result or not. And if it wasn't able to store the result, it means the error would not be nil. And so if nil is different from whatever the value is in ERR, then I do a fail. So let's rerun our program here and see failure to get storage engine. And then, of course, I got a storage engine and I was able to um, get some data. And so there was no data. So um, there's no point in trying to get a storage engine. So uh, we could see my application is looking um, well cool, right? Um, so, um, all right. So I'm going to take off that and just simply put that it's finished successfully. So now we have an actual application and it's using cases, it's using if, and it's using a pointer store thing. Well, if um, we actually take this sort of seriously and I get in data, do I really want to return a string? Um, because if I return a string and then I pass it to the compute thing, it's going to make a copy, all right? And so, first of all, it's going to get the data in here. And then when I try to return it, that's going to be a copy that's going to be returned to my main program. Then my main program is going to pass that string to the compute. So it too is going to make a copy. So the data is going to get whatever string I allocate inside of get data is going to get copied once when it pass it out here, then get copied a second time when it pass it in here. So if this string is really as big as I said it is, I really don't want to do all that copying. So really, I want this to be a pointer to a string and this also to be a pointer to a string. And so when I do this, what I want to do is initialize my D and return just a pointer. And since here I don't have anything to return, I'm going to put nil. Okay. So all this means, again, this is a very contrived application, but like I said, let's pretend we're taking it seriously. Then... Um, and then, of course, since I want to compute the length of the string, this is a pointer to string, so I dereference my string, and then I compute length over it. And my application should still work the exact same way, right? All I've done now is said, you know, if this was really a real application and I'm returning a ton of data, like I'm saying, from when I do get data that I'm going to need to run some computation over, I, pass, I want to pass around a pointer, okay? All right. So where does the packages come in? Like everything we've written now is in one giant main file. So we know about packaging, so we can kind of think about it. And if we look, we have this clear separation between these functions. There's things that, you know, get data from storage and put data back in storage. And then there's the thing that run this computation. And so it might make sense for us to try and organize our application, um, this directory accordingly. So storage, we have a storage directory. And it seems like we have a compute directory, right? Where all the compute stuff goes. So in storage, what do we have? Well, let's do storage.go. I mean, we can definitely write individual file for the get storage and retrieve storage thing, but we're going to um, use one file for now. And we can call it package storage, right? And if you remember that we set it out each package, you can optionally have a funct init function that gets called for that package. So for example, we can do like log print ln. Um, this is storage, pa packet storage, packet storage being initialized, for example. Let's do it this way. All right, and I'm gonna copy this since I probably want this in my compute too. And then I uh, create another thing called compute that go, and I'm gonna paste that there. Call this compute. That's the package uh, compute and package compute. And you want to keep your package name pretty small. If you notice in Go, the package names are fairly small. So compute package being initialized. Okay. So what do I put in my compute package? Well, look like this guy only. So I'm gonna cut that, put that in my compute package, paste it there. Now, um, what that means is here, if I actually wanna do compute and send package, I have to use the name. So I have to say storage, um, compute, sorry, compute that run compute. So that's the package it's in, okay? And 
pretty soon I should see, well, here it's complaining at all, um, undefined computer on computation. Well, um, that's because um, Go doesn't know where um, this package has not been compiled yet, um, but just now we'll fix that just now. Let's keep going and put our other things inside um, their own packages. So I'm gonna cut this and put this inside of the storage package, right? And we needed to have um, RAND um, be initialized. If you remember from um, here, we were initializing that there. So we don't actually need RAND over there. So I'll put it here and I'm gonna put it inside this guy, okay? Because we're using the random number generator in these two functions, so there's no point in having them initialized in, in both places. So, okay, so that's looking up right now. Um, we have the imports being adjusted there and compute. Um, yep, that's looking good. So let's go back here and now we're going to do this as storage that get data and storage that um, store result. Okay. Um, one of the things we well, if we try to run our application, we could see how the red mark right there, if we try to run it right now, it says the stuff is undefined. So one of the things we can do is say, well, you know, uh, and we could, you know, totally compile this, like we can go into each one of the directory and say, um, let's see, oh, storage, um, go build, um, um, and then that install that package for us, and we could go to the compute one and say go build and now when we go back here um, if we say um, import um, storage and there it is and we can import compute right come on compute and there it is right and I should expect these messages to go away pretty soon. Um, come on. Refer to an exported package name. Oh, it's the metal, um, basically, um, I have inside those packages, those names are private, which uh, da, da, of course they are. So now I have um, my store result. So let's make that public name and if I'm going to make it public I should put some documentation on it so I'm going to say store result takes an int and writes it to the storage engine All right and then get storage engine is private because that's being used by get data um, by store results so I don't need to export that but get data is being used publicly. So I can say get data, retrieve all right. Uh, okay, let's just say get data returns data runs data if it's if if it's available. Available. Okay. So that's fine. And so if I go here now, all I need to do is change these because they're being exported from my package. So that they have to have the capital um letter to means exported in Go if you remember. Alright, so Unless something is in the same package, it can't use um, a function in that package unless it's so my main is in a different package than storage and compute. So it couldn't use those lowercase. If those are also called main, these files are also called main, then it would use it. But they're in different packages. So I have to use, I have to export them and use them. So store result, um, undefined, let me see, store result. Um, that should be fine, store result. Yep, function store result. Okay, um, I think I need to rebuild my package here. I said kind of run computations. We already know this is a compute package. I'm gonna call it just um, K 
calc, you know, C A L C. And I'm gonna go back here and I'm gonna say compute that calculate results basically. And oh, notice how that error went away because it was built. And so no, nope, notice how um, my compute package was also built once it was saved and it's imported. This one uh, on the find store result, why is it telling me storage? Uh, da, 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 da. What did I type incorrectly? Storage that store result. Storage that store result. Okay. Storage that store result. Huh. Uh, let me rebuild my application and see that storage. Let me come rebuild that. Um, now, once you have the package name defined properly, Go will actually build. So you only have to stay in your main, in this directory and work on main. And these other packages will get automatically built by Go as it's, you know, saving, it would build them. Um, so I was having an error because I didn't export my public functions. And the one I don't get now is why this one is saying undefined storage that store result. So let me just copy this name because did I misspell this? Okay, why is it being so silly? Store result. It looks to be the same to me. It takes an int and it returns an error. And here, oh, there it goes. It finally updated and fixed it. I don't know, maybe I had a type in error that I'm not seeing. Okay, so now let's go run main and um, Undefined storage that store result. Why I'm seeing that message before, but it's not happening here. Um, go run main 29. Now, this is silly. If error equals the storage. Oh, ah, I see. This is so it's from the wrong application. Ah, this is when I was um, troubleshooting. Ah, uh, uh, 2s12. All right, from the wrong thing. So including the wrong package. Ah, make sure you if you're doing multiple implementation of a package that you're pulling in the right right one. So that was pulling it in from the wrong directory. Sorry about that. Oh, no one day was giving me that error message. All right. So no, the, look at that. It's working now. Working, working, working. Okay, I got some error, no data. I got some error with my storage engine at one time, and then I was able to get um, data. Okay, all right, so that's working fine. So now we see that oh, we have this um, stuff, our application broken out into packages, and the things that we depend on, well, that's what we depend on, and these packages, I can, they're gonna be pushed up to GitHub, and you can just use those by themselves. You can actually use this exact same um, path import and it will work for you, either one of these packages. So you can use my compute part and your storage part or vice versa or both just by writing a main application that looks exactly like this. You don't even need these subdirectories because these subdirectories are here, but when they're saved, they're gonna be in GitHub in this path. Okay, well, we can go do a little bit more in terms of organizing our application. If you think about main, main is just our client application that's running, right? And we haven't built it. We've been running it by just going go, go run. But what we can actually do is say, think ahead and say, you know, in terms of clients, we can have multiple clients. We can have a client that's a CLI, right? Command line interface. Or we can have a client that's, you know, for example, is an HTTP interface to our application. Later on when we do the HTTP package, we can see how easy it is to take this and turn it into a web, web backend that would listen to us sending some data um, to our application and then getting the result or even just asking for the result over that interface. And so that can be used to drive our application, right? And so our Client, HTTP one would be very in that it would get data from the web browser instead with a user submit, run it on our comp calculate, and then return the result back to the user. But a little bit ahead of our time. But you can see how we can reuse these things in different way, ways. So why don't we just move our main into client CLI. We're gonna go into client CLI and we're gonna do go build. 
and that gives us a command line interface that we can now run repeatedly, all right? And um, if you haven't noticed, notice how the initialization function for each one of our packages getting run before our main application. Now, so this is a lot better and this sort of sets us up to organizing, I'm sure, so we can organize larger application by breaking it down. Um, there's one other thing I want to cover about packages. Now imagine, so I'm going to close up this and I'm going to just stay here. I'm going to create a directory and I'm going to call it silly because this is going to be a silly package. And I'm going to call it silly.go. I'm going to say package silly and I'm going to put a init function here. Funct init and it's going to be log that print ln. This is package silly okay and now let's just put uh, a function in a font foo and it's a public function for example let's say, but no private function let's do a private function that's not callable so this package doesn't even provide any public facing method okay um, function or any capability that you can use from outside and it doesn't matter what this does but because it's private, notice that nobody else can actually use it from the outside. But why would I have a, a package like this? Well, maybe I, like, I want it for the side effect, which is when init ran, it did a bunch of things that I wanted. And so I can still import this package, but since I don't want, need the name to use it, I can say I want to use silly. All right? And um, let's see, silly is going to be inside here. So let's copy, put that here. And so this is my silly package. Uh, come on. This is my silly package. And notice how I use this underscore here, which you're going to see more and more of. We talk about when we were talking about variables. And so this is sort of like a variable placeholder. And essentially what I'm saying, if I didn't put this, then my automatic import thing would remove it because it would say, oh, you're importing this package silly, but you're not actually calling anything in it. There's nothing to call in silly. Like we said, there's nothing that's being exported from it. So there's nothing to call, but by putting this underscore, it keeps it. And so now I'll get the benefit of, let's um, rebuild my command line and run it. And you can see that the silly package is being used because it initialized, the init function in it is actually being call so I get the side effect of whatever that's doing without actually having to use anything in silly because there's nothing for me to use. Now there may be packages that have a nice side effect on the init. I might actually expose things, export things that you want to use and you might not want to use them but it has them there. In either case this is an example of how you get the side effect of a package. Side effect being how you get it to run its init method without actually using it. And so okay that's the final thing I want to say about in it and note again every package can have an in it okay and they all get run before main for that application so that is it i'm going to cut it off here this video has been pretty long um but i hope that how uh, what you get you get to take away from it is application organization uh, in addition get to review using you know um Flow control if and switch statement. We didn't use a for here, um, you know, and pointers and giving you a hint of why it might be uh, better to use something like pointer. For example, we talk about it uh, when we cover about, you know, data and data type. Um, and um, hopefully you, you know, can try this out, mess with it, you know, just play around. It's not that complicated an application but it kind of set the foundation by pulling a number of things together. So if you understand how to pull this and reproduce this, then I think that oh, you're well on your way and it's just show command of the material that's been covered so far. So you should definitely try and reproduce this and in your own way, but at least get the general idea of breaking it up and doing some of these simple things. Okay, take care. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it very much. Um, thank you for subscribing. And if you haven't subscribed, please do. And if you're subscribed or you haven't subscribed, still please spread the word and let other people know. And I'll see you in the next video. And that's going to be in chapter three. Okay, take care. Bye.